Jay Demer, thanks for coming. It's very good to be here, Michael. Yeah, Thank we. Uh, it was. It was. Yeah, we've been trying to do this for I think a year and a half. It was when um, our mutual friend Brittany, I yep. think, had lunch with you like last mm -hmm. spring or something. Yeah, uh, somewhere in West Van or something like that. And I talked to her afterwards. She was like, "Oh my God, I just <laughs> had the most interesting conversation of my my life." Right? And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "All right." She's very complimentary in that way. She's she's great. She's uh, she's my probably one of our most enthusiastic friends and very uh, <laughs> very driven and, and very good at what she does. So it's uh, it's always nice to. Uh, to hear those so yeah great, great words you know yeah no she's good people and and you know she's been great and and i mean this whole community has been great and why i've started this thing is, mm -hmm. has, has been great but because uh, i don't know why i continually get surprised when people sit in this chair and, and they're so amazing but i gotta <laughs> stop doing that i gotta kind of like angle more towards like uh hope for humanity or something like that yeah but it, no, it's kind of hard it, right game changing moves you know you got to get the game changers on and you can make some game changing moves so it's uh it's good well i'm sitting beside a game changer right here like i've been been digging into you a bit the last few days and it's been an inspiring journey you know like the there's the soccer background there's the the work you do with youth and then there's like uh, all these entrepreneurial ventures that you have going on as well <laughs> yeah. But I, I I started I believe watching your 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 TED talk, which was which was great, um, and specifically I, I love the like the opening with with the clip of the soccer mm -hmm. and and the, and the huge goal of of you coming out, you and the team coming out onto the field in front of seventy thousand fans, and then you scoring a gorgeous huge goal, <laughs> right? Yeah. Huge goal. I can still feel it. Right. right in my head, I can. <laughs> Do you miss that? Do you miss that? Do you miss those days? What was that like? What was because I understand that that goal was to get you into the Premier League. That that win in that game. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. which is huge. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's that game itself is the most lucrative game in all of sports, and so you know, you talk about you know people in Canada will say the Stanley Cup, Game Seven, or you know World Series or World uh, World Cups, but it's actually not like because of the Premier League money that the Championship, which is the first division in the UK. The, the money rise because of the TV revenue, because by far it's the most watched, you know, thing on television is the Premier League. And so the money that comes with that to get into that league is, is it's, it's massive. And so clubs are right now getting, I think it's like 120 million pounds, which is a lot of money. But again, to stay in the Premier League, it's really hard. And so with that, you got to buy new players. You have to improve your stadium. You have to improve your field. And all of a sudden that money just gets rinsed. And so it's like a survival game, but because in England, they, they work on a, a relegation promotion system. So the top three teams in every league go up a league every year and the bottom three teams in every league go down a league. And so there every year there's, there's six new fixtures. And so within that, it keeps every season interesting. The roller coaster is always on and uh, it, it's uh, for players. It's, it's incredible because, you know, you don't, you don't really understand passion until you've, you've been to those European stadiums and you, and you see that culture. Uh, you know that the Englands, the Italy, Italy's, and all all that kind of stuff really create within their soccer culture. What I would obviously over their football culture, but that's where I learned. You know, I was just a kid from three sport athlete from Green Bay, Wisconsin, before I kind of stepped into the big leagues over there and really started to learn my trade. And your story was you you were like twenty one or so, and 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 didn't get a, a deal over here in North America. But you're like, and and most people would have given up and, and, and packed it in there but you're like no i'm going over <laughs> yeah. to where 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 the sport is the biggest and you started at the bottom ninth ninth division mm -hmm. and then worked your way all the way up to the premier league uh played in two world cups you know represented the u.s and then and then played for the white caps here as well but what like what what, what was with that decision what was, what was what was with that decision to go over there and, and start at the bottom when most would have just packed it in i think it's uh a little bit of craziness, a little bit of belief, and I think a lot of uh I like to say a lot of uh a lot of this ability to uh, believe in yourself when nobody does. And, and but again, that comes with the, the truth of belief. And I think uh, we talk about this a lot in our programs. And, and, and so it's like, there's a difference between saying, I believe I can do something and actually believing that you can go out and do something. And I think, you know, I wasn't picked, but I was in a position in the university system in America with NCAA Division One. Good, you know, there's a lot of it. University but playing at that level, you play against a lot of good players, and so with that, I'd play against the guy that was in the MLS or getting drafted, and I would do well. But because I wasn't on the team sheet until I was 18, I didn't come through a system. I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We have a football team, and that's about it. So as a soccer player. You know, I played basketball in the winters. My dad was a track coach at my high school. Both my parents were teachers, and so I just was around sports my whole life. But 
I wasn't a part of academies. I wasn't a part of ODP or, or provincial programs and in, in, in ways that I would have been on that piece of paper. Not only to get recruited, I didn't get recruited out of high school. I had one college scholarship out of my own home hometown university, University of Wisconsin Green Bay, good school, but I didn't want to be in my hometown. I, I was eighteen. I wanted to get out of there, but I also I wanted to go to Chicago because they had a good arts program. And so I went to school for design. I have a degree in product design, which is you know how do you design this microphone and everything that comes with it. That's all product design. And so I had four years of being creative, learning how to be creative, learning about design mindset all these kind of things that really helped me become a professional soccer player that I didn't even know. And so I think all of those pieces, you know, to long windedly answer your question is that all those pieces kind of fit. And it was like, okay, I can be creative enough to create my own path. I'm humble enough to know what's in front of me. I'm actually paying attention to the people that are in front of me that I know I've played well against that are now playing in the professional leagues that got the chance and I haven't. And then now I got to weigh up my opportunities to see what the best shot is. And so staying here and walking onto division two, II, division three teams in America would have made me about two, well, $20,000 a year at the time. Yeah. And it, with a design degree, I was like, I'll go make 40 out of college and I'll just be a designer. I can, I can go do that. And so at the time I was playing with a kid in Chicago who was English and he's like, Hey, by the end of the season, I'm going back to live with my mom in London. Have you ever thought about playing overseas? And I'm like, dude, I can't even make it here. Like, how am I getting overseas? Like, that doesn't really make any sense. But at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking that is a good opportunity because I know English football and I know that if I can get an opportunity to play at that level and I can live in a place for free in London in an attic, even though the attic isn't, you know, your ideal situation, but in a way it was giving me a roof. And that's all I cared about. I was just coming off of college. I know how to live with just a roof. That wasn't a problem for me. I know how to live with through spaghetti and beans on toast and, and a gallon of milk a week. Like I, I know how to do that. And so with that, it was kind of giving me this confidence that I could kind of step into those environments and, and really give myself a true shot. And so I looked at all those pieces. I saw myself in, in the, the best shot that I could achieve for myself. And that was move to England, start at the bottom of the, of, of the, of the, of the layers, but the light at the end of the tunnel is way more massive. And so give yourself that chance because you got to do it the hard way anyway. So did you, epic, did, did, did you, was that the intention, the light at the end of the, the tunnel, the, the Premier League? Like you, you weren't going over there uh, just to give it a go and just to kind of play for a couple of years and, and see what happens. You were going over there to go to the top. Yeah. And I, yeah, I like to, you know, I call this whole concept of, of, of kind of the whole story was like dreaming big, but thinking small. So, you know, like I knew that I wasn't just going to land and go up to Manchester United's doors and go like, hey. I'm this walk on American dude that's 23 years old and you got to give me a trial. Like they'd laugh and slam the door in your face. Like I know the, I know the environment. And so I knew I'd have to earn it, but I just needed that. I, again, I needed a door and the door for me was a ninth division opportunity in the UK. And the good thing about not only my research, but just knowing their culture was that if I can be good, I'll be seen in, in North America. It's not always the case. Like you're playing in Michigan. Do you know how many teams are in Michigan? <laughs> I know the football team. Yeah, probably not many. And and so with that, like I gotta go to Ohio to be seen. I and back then it was different than now. There's scouting networks, there's videos, there's ways that you can kind of bridge that gap a little bit more. But f at the time I, I had to like pick a place and it was the lower division and I wasn't doing anything in the States since I wasn't getting picked. I wasn't on sheets of paper. So I'm like, England, interesting. Yes, harder. Yes, I know it's the biggest jungle in the world, but I have I have a place to stay. I have an opportunity to start at any level. And then now it's up to me and to, to believe in the intuition and to believe in myself enough to know that that is on purpose, that is with intention. And I went there with intention. I, I didn't know how long it would take. I, I didn't know how far I would go. Uh, again, Premier League was the dream. But the thing small was, why don't you start making it into the professional league, which is the top four. So the, in England, the English soccer pyramid is uh, top of the league is, is, is the Premier League. Then it's the championship, the, arguably the old first division. Then it's second, third, fourth. So there's four divisions, all on the relegation, promotion, professional league. And so I was like, my goal in the beginning was to make it into the professional leagues. From there, I started playing against professional league teams, getting some trials against them in my first season. Um, I didn't, it took me about a half a year to get into the lineup. Because, dude, imagine like, I always say, imagine a 23-year-old American moving into the English football culture. 
do you think they're just gonna be like, hey, yeah, walk right into the starting lineup, and yeah, hey, you're really good. The first question I got asked is like, you're a Yank, like, what are you doing here? Yeah, because we're not supposed to play soccer for one, or if we even called it soccer, we get in trouble, you know, in England. And so you know, you you got to learn your p's and q's very quickly. But what that culture did was really start to give me a fast track to what it's truly like, and 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 I think putting myself into that turbo environment or that environment where it was going to be tough, where I was, you know, in the deep end with the best culture in the world. But that's why I'm here. You know, I'm not here to mess around. I'm not here to like sit here and kick tires in the fourth division in America and make 18 grand like that, that for me that defeats the whole purpose. And so I was I was I was very quickly into that mindset of like, if I'm going to go for it, we go for it. And then I've, by the end of that season, I started to get more indicators. Again, if you're humble and you look, I'm looking at the people that are playing or just got released from a third division team and I'm playing with them in my fourth division, fifth division team. And they're like, you're a good player. Now I have zero experience. And these guys that have been in pros their whole lives are like, you're pretty decent. What are you doing here? How are, you know, what's your plan? Do you have an agent? What are you doing here? I have a third division tryout because they all get little, little back money payments. Yeah. I found this guy in this park. I'll get a signing on fee if that person signs for a Premier League club or whatever. So there's a lot of that going on in 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 the UK. And so I became kind of a part of that. I started to get some whispers that there were people looking at me, but then I had some trouts and I didn't make it. Uh, one of them, and I like to talk about those too, because it's not always the rosy way. And and when I first got my tryout, I was a third division team called Oxford United. Um, we drove all the way out there. I spent all the money. I was making 40 bucks a game, 40. So I get a little cash envelope with my name on it. Actually, in the beginning, it wasn't even my name because I was playing under my buddy's brother because I didn't have a work permit. And uh, so I <laughs> I get 40 pounds in an envelope and I'd spend 20 on food, didn't the kitty for the family. And then I would save 20 bucks to last me the week. Like that was my budget at the time. And so I spent all my money to get out to Oxford. Uh, soccer Soccer games are 90 minutes long. And they put me in the 87th minute. And I walked out there and I ran up back the defense once and I blew the whistle. And that was it. And, you know, like failure says like, oh, yeah, I got to call my mom and I got to tell her that I didn't make it. And we were all excited for this opportunity. This is what I've been sitting in the park for a year and sleeping in an attic for. But I didn't work. I didn't get my shot. But my mentality, again, because it was built through adversity, because I was used to this, it didn't surprise me because I took a different look. I was like, I just hopped six divisions. That's my focus. Beginning this year, I was playing ninth. I just got a third division trial. Focus on the six. Don't focus on the result of the one. And so when I started to really look at, do I want to stay? Is this, should I keep going? Or was this my shot? That very quickly became keep going. Because then I got another third division trial. Same same level uh, at the end of that season. And so then we're like, okay, or am I going to come back for preseason? So I had two months off, came back to Chicago, worked, worked camps, worked at the bar. You know, I was a bartender and doing all that, all that fun service work. Um, and then I, I'm like, yeah, signs are good. Put it that way. Six divisions. I'm not looking at the, I didn't make those trials. I looked at those trials and I go, did I get a fair shake? Did I get my full shot? Both of them were a no. And so I decided to keep going. And then I came back. My coach had moved from the ninth division to a, 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 a seventh division team called Northwood, which was wasn't far from Watford, which is this team northwest London, twenty five minutes out of out of central London. Uh, Elton John's famously owned it twice, and he's 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 the, their famous owner. He doesn't own it anymore, but he's considered the life president. And we'll get to Elton later. But the the idea was like I had heard of this club. I knew it wasn't a huge club. I knew they were looking for players, and I got to play against them in this preseason friendly. And so. They put their first team out. I got to play against really good players. And it just so happened they had just, and again, I think that stories will always, it's almost they find like they find you. And you got to put yourself into the environment to succeed. And so I'm very much like that. And and, and I look at my story and, and, and I would have, you know, putting myself into that environment, but actually having the mentality to perform when it mattered and against good players is hard, is hard to do. But I was able to do that. And and then, then then you get this opportunity, and and so they took me on trial. They had just come down from the Premier League, so they did, they were trying to offload money, guys, and so they didn't have any money to bring people in. But good thing, you don't know, need, this, this, take 20, much. this twenty three year old American <laughs> was, was, was dead free. It's <laughs> <laughs> coming cheap. Yeah, it was free, and so they needed me. I needed them, uh, and and uh, I made the team. 
Um, again, they kind of threw me through the ringer in my trial. Generally in Europe, you go to trial for two weeks. So you get usually a reserve game, which is like the second team. Um, I got to look at the first team guys. I got to eat lunch with them and I didn't get to play with them. And, and I like telling the story too, because it's kind of like when you get thrust into these environments, of like high performance, you better be ready. And, and uh, the coach calls me in his office. And he's like, hey, I hear you've been doing well with the reserves. You know, we got our first team game tomorrow night at the stadium. You know, Rob Watford is like a 25,000 seat stadium and decent size. Um, but he's like, come, we've got this giant Spanish team called Real Zaragoza coming tomorrow. So he's like, come, we'll try to get you involved. So I'm thinking again, I haven't even trained with these guys. Like I might get to sit on the bench. Maybe I'll get to warm up and like feel what this feels like. You know what I mean? Crowds, people, good, good players, all the rest. And I walked into the stadium on the day. And I would say I like had my wind up camera. Remember those like clickers, you know, just winding up, yeah, taking yeah. pictures of the stadium yeah, yeah. on the way in, thinking like this might be the opportunity. Yeah. And I walk into the to the changing room and I, and I was in the starting lineup. He put me in the whiteboard with 10 other guys I didn't even train with, let alone played with in front of a full stadium against a Spanish La Liga team, top division team in Spain. And uh, then I realized very quickly that uh, things were about to get very serious. <laughs> and uh we have these self-talk moments you know like self-talk becomes this topic of you know how do we deal with these shock and all moments in our life and a lot of times it's because of how we talk to ourselves in those moments and where our mentality is built from how do you how do you self-talk your way into success instead of self-talking your way out of it um is kind of a story of, of, of a lot of my existence, really. And, and, and this was really my first and biggest self-talk moment because I was freaking out. He didn't tell me. And then I got angry. I'm like, well, fuck this guy. Why didn't I? He didn't even tell me. And I'm already blaming a coach who's actually giving me the opportunity of my life. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, in, and I go to the bathroom. So I'm just sitting in the stall. I'm just sitting there with my head in my hands, you know, swearing myself and and can't really believe that I'm in this situation, but I got to get my shit together very quickly because in about 15 minutes, I got to go out there and warm up with a bunch of guys I've never trained with in, in front of 25,000 people and play well because this is my shot. And so I remember just really giving my head a shake. I probably slapped myself in the face, did something to like be like, don't go there. My mind was going to places that did not serve me. And so I decided that I needed to wake myself up and start focusing on things that did. And so I, I, reminded myself that I had been sleeping on a gra in the ground on a mattress in someone else's attic for a year, uh, how shitty it is to make 40 bucks a week and try to survive and, and, and be a person. And also, this is the opportunity of a lifetime, so don't mess it up. This is what I've been waiting for. This is why you're sleeping on the ground. And this is why you're in a country that's not yours, believing in yourself when no one else believes in you kind of idea. Like, you're going to complain about this now? You're going to get upset at this situation? Like, shake your head and, and, and get into it. And so that's kind of what I, what I had to do and, and, and what I did. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I played the whole 90 minutes. He played me the whole game. Uh, we lost 2-1, but I, I didn't give up any of the big goals or anything like that. And he kind of called me in his office after the game. He's laughing. And he's like, gives me this little head nod. And he's like, hey, what'd you think? And I'm like, I shake my head and I remember this forever. And I go, I think you're an asshole. <laughs> I'm like, why didn't you tell me? Dude? Like, for real, why didn't you tell me? And, he, and he's like, he goes, Jay, because at this level, you you, you got to sink or swim. And I got to, we got to take chances on players. He said, there's a line out the door of players that want to come and be a part of this club. We got to know if you're ready. You come from a long way. I know your story, but we got to know if you're ready because you got to play tomorrow if, if, if we need you. And he said, you did more than enough. He said, did you, did, did you have an agent? And I kind of lied. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll go. You know, I was talking to like a buddy I played with who knew an agent. So I kind of kind of lied a little bit, but then uh, got got him in and, and got my first deal. And it was a one year, 25,000 pound deal. <laughs> better than 40 bucks. <laughs> better a week. than better, way better than 40 bucks a week. So I, that got me in the door and that started my Watford career. Amazing. Yeah. But it's fundamentally rooted in a belief of self. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in each and every way. And then, but there's so many instances to stop believing in ourselves and, and our dreams and our, our goals. But also like you had to, you had to have known you were good, right? You have, you have, you got to believe in your skills, you, you, but you're taking in information everywhere. You're like, well, I'm playing against these guys. They're this, I'm, I'm that. So I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the, the, the ring. Right. Um, but it's like, it's a lot of awareness for a, a early 20 something year old. Right. To, to be able to chart out that path and not get distracted by like, 
booze and girls and and and, and whatever. But I was distracted by those too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it wasn't letting him define my performances. My yeah. performances was were built off the you know, again the purpose. And and to your point. It, it is easy to get distracted, but and then I go back to the whole idea of this awareness piece. And I believe that that was built in a design curriculum. In design, we are taught to look at everything as a, uh, there are no problems, only solutions. Everything is a, is something that can be better. This, if, if I'm trying to be a designer and I'm trying to design a microphone, like they designed this thing because they realized that if I talk into this thing, it's actually, it's, it's, it's more clear, but it's louder and it doesn't work as well. So I'm going to build this thing and make this better because that's an improvement on the already existing design. So if you think about this as a designer and I had five, four and a half years of education and looking at a problem and trying to find ways to make it better. It's what a design mind is. It was a curriculum that really created my mentality as a, as a person, um, my support as my life, my had a good family that created my confidence to go out and take risks and be who I was because I knew I'd be loved. But the other piece of that was now, who are you and what are you going to do? And so I was a designer in mind. I looked at my life like, a, like it's a design, like it's a, how do I make that better? How do I change the button on that environment? What was that environment like? Give myself feedback, because that's what we do. You, you have a concept, you create a product, you get feedback, and then you create another product based on that mm -hmm. feedback. And so the idea is like, I was doing the same thing for myself. I would create a product, I would look at it, I'd get a reviews i wouldn't just again ego says that was my review and i'm the best and that person that said that i didn't very good mess than them and i'm not gonna i'm there i don't believe them they're full of shit that's ego talking it's not hey what did you think hey coach like if you if you think that i'm gonna play pro like what would you say the top two things i need to do to actually get there would be and i'm asking those questions the whole time every time because that's what my mindset was built around improving and that's all you do. And so I started focusing on that, asking the right questions, getting good feedback, having my own feedback, cross-referencing that with the feedback of said coach or said captain, people that I knew had been there before that I didn't know, um, or that I wanted to be like, and then go, hey, what did you think? Oh, I think your left foot out of the back is crap, but you win every ball in the air. Your, your first step is, is as good as I've seen at this level. And I think if you keep working and, and, and working on your left foot passing on the back and your long switch ball, this is real feedback that I got. Yeah, I think you could, you could make a pro. It was the feedback I was getting from players and coaches that had been in pros before. And that's who I asked. So I'm not going to ask some ninth divisioner that's like, hey, I'm happy to be here too. Because that was me. I'm going to go ask the guy that was released from a, a second division team, played for Wales for five years, and in a youth World Cup. Hey, dude, what do you think? You've played against the best. Like, it, it, could I get there? This is a a, a huge point because it's it's a complete uh, separation from ego. One thing, but it's so it's like yeah, if we we view ourselves as the the product or, or and we're trying to get somewhere and do something, but I don't. I haven't heard it ever explained that way or, or know anyone that, that does it quite as systematically like that, but it is relatively straightforward. Like if I'm mm -hmm. trying to achieve X, give me the feedback from, from the right people because I, I don't know how to be X, right? I know mm -hmm. how to be Y or, or A, whatever it is, but ask the right people, park the ego because they're going to, you want to define the people that tell you where you suck, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but there's such a distance between where we are in our dreams and our goals. They're huge, and, and <laughs> yeah. but a lot of us and a lot of people get so frustrated. So if if they do get a little feedback, usually it's from the wrong person. They'll, they'll get feedback from someone who's wanting to hold them back. Yeah, right. Yeah, so or it's don't from the person ask those that will, people that will tell them what they really their ego wants to hear. Yeah, like or yeah, like you're like you're good. No, I'm not good. If I was good, I was be I'd be at the I'd be where I want in my mm -hmm. in my dream or my goal. But mm -hmm. that's. That's such a relatively simple concept, but the, I think the the separation from the ego and feeling bad is a place a lot of people get challenged at and with. Yeah, and you, and you know, a lot of that is 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 driven by the wrong things. You know, again, if you're if you're searching for improvement, again, going back to design mind, that's the idea. It's like change the button because I did it three times, and it, it, weird, it's weird. If Don't I press turn that it here, red button though. I Keep won't. Talking, though. But but the design. yeah and so the you know the idea is is like you know you can be honest with the idea and and so with that now comes this whole idea now what do I do with that idea how do you actually how do you actually I think well, yeah I think we're good how do you actually practice that idea yeah and so first is feedback feedback you can take it leave it it's like it's like when you're in a relationship yeah and you go what let's talk about it 
And some things you can get angry at and hold and think it's yours or think it's her, hers. But in the end, like some of it, you have to feel and then let it go because it's not yours. And so there's a lot of that in, in sports too. It's because it's like a coach will have their opinion about the way you are. A player will have an opinion about the way you are. The relationship you create between all of those things will create a belonging. But at the end of the day, it's your performances that matter. And so that's really the microscope. And then you go, okay, cool. Well, now I can, now that I have the microscope on this, like, let's dissect this performance. What was it? Do, you know, if you start, then now you work back from there. So it's this whole, like, you know, again, the dream big thing small is like, now we're thinking small. We're going, I won this many headers. I kept the ball this many times. I didn't give away the ball this many times. And the three guys that I was marking for the 93 minutes had one shot on goal and zero shots on target. Or sorry, zero, zero goals. Now I'm working backwards and I'm back at the finite level of like how I'm assessing my, myself, my performances. And now I check that with a couple other people. And if all of those things are clear, then we go, okay, that's us now. That's presence. Now what? Okay, cool. That's good. Are we better than we were yesterday? Yes. Are we getting opportunities in the direction I'm facing? Yes. Again, ninth division to third, third division to one. Now I'm in the first division. Same idea. What the process never changes, whether you're ninth or first. For me, the mindset stayed exactly the same. Amazing. And then did you, you know, let's fast forward to, to I guess, the end of the your soccer career. End, ended with white caps. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So what was the transition? First of all, what, 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 like, what, what was, I guess, the last year like of, of, of this, this career and, and what you've accomplished and, and, and built and, and put all the pieces in place and you got to come, come to your second home or, or home mm -hmm. to Vancouver and, and finish it here? Like, what were you... Um, did you know it was, it was kind of coming to an end? Was there some, um, were you hanging on to something there? Did you want it to last longer? What were, what, 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 and then what was the transition kind of beyond that? And then taking the same sort of mindset into finding what you're going to do, do next. But what, like, what was that period like? Yeah. I mean, I mean, high performance is really fun. Yeah. You know, when you get into your, your true flow of who you are as a professional, again, it took me I turned pro at 23. I was. I was finally who I wanted to be both on the field and off when I was 30. It took me about seven or eight years. Again, I played in a World Cup. I was one of the best in the world. You know, you get to be one of 11. I got to play every minute of the World Cup in 2010 for the United States. Uh, again, we won our group for the first time. So we did something no American team ever did. Uh, the year before that, we snapped Spain's 35 game win streak. So I got to play in all these incredible mm -hmm. moments and these big, big games. And when we know billions of people are watching. And when you perform at that level, when you know that, that's when you know. That's when you know you're flowing because you, you have all this pressure. You know, we always used to talk about the pressure of the eyeballs and a couple billions a lot. You know, and when you play in the Premier League and you play in the World Cup environments, you know the world's watching. And so the pressure of the eyeballs is very different than walking out in a BC place in front of 25. Like it's, it is. It's just, it's just different. But when you get to those environments, when you get to high performance at that level, it's what you want. It's everything that you've desired. It's everything that you work for. And so now you get there and you're like, no, I'm going to mess that up. Like, that's not the way that it works. Like, in order to perform at the highest level and keep that high performance level, you have to be consistent and you have to be able to how to learn how to be consistent. So first couple seasons, 23 to 25, some games good, some games okay, staying in the lineup. You know, by the end of my second season, again, I score this goal in front of 70,000 people and I get man of the match. And we get to promote to the Premier League. And I'm standing there talking at the Jumbotron, talking about how with this glass ball going two years earlier, I was sitting in a bar in Chicago wondering if I'd even make it as a professional. And so you can see how fast it can go. But when you really, truly have earned the right to be there and then you're there, you're like, how do I stay here now? Like the, the focus shift doesn't shift to like this constant search. It's like I've been searching and now I'm here. So now I got to like, how do I stay here? And so then it goes to shifts to consistency. It's not this like big dream anymore. Now I'm in the dream. And now I got to shift my focus to how do I, how do I stay super consistent? How do I stay even more high performance and really keep turning that needle to find and refine and refine to get to that point where you want to walk out into 2 billion eyeballs and be like, I'm wearing this badge on purpose. Somebody chose me to be one of 11 and the best, you know, biggest sporting event on the planet. Like, there's an honor in there. So you don't want to mess that up. But in a way, when you walk out with those confidences in those environments, that's when you know you're in, in peak performance. Amazing. Um, 
it's sort of what Sherrod was talking about when he was sitting here. He's like, and, and what your TEDx was about is like, we always prepare for, for the worst. Like, why not focus on, on the sunny days? Like, let's expect the good things to happen. Let's focus on the sunny days, put our mindset towards that. You know, this is what we want. So many excuses to, to challenge yeah. us and throw yeah, us yeah. off, but let's do more about like focusing on the sunny days when, when good things happen. And then Sherrod added onto that. He was like, when it gets there, I love, I love this clip that everybody yeah, said, no, he's so and you work it, right? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, when, when the good things happen, when you're in a good place, you work it. And the consistency when you're at that, that high level is, is an element of high performance, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to stay at that, that level and stay in there and stay aware and stay healthy and stay, stay dialed in. Like that's high performance. Consistency mm -hmm. in itself is high performance. Yeah. And fear goes away because it's what you've asked for. And so now it's time to play. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like that was always my thing. It's like you do all the hard work and all of a sudden the lights are on and you're like, this is why I'm here. Like this is the goal. So now you're, now you're walking out to the goal and now you got to be scared. Like that performance anxiety does not exist when you are flowing and when you are the person and the player that you have worked your ass off to be. I think what I've had a lot over the previous years and things I'm, I'm, creating and doing and, and growing towards is it's been a lot of like uh well why not me mm -hmm. why not me like if they can do it he can do it she can do it like we all start kind of from the same place you know mm -hmm. plus or minus right different you know different factors in, in that and different opportunities mm -hmm. and, and all of that but if they can do that and and i like that sort of thing and i have fun doing that sort of thing then then why can i not also achieve that no exactly and 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 the reason is yes. Why not? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the idea, but that's, that's a belief system at its core too. And so, you know, I believe that that's like the positive side of comparison culture is, is, is when you look at a comparison as almost a mentor or a goal instead of a, a, a an unachievable task. Cause I think a lot of times, especially now in modern day, we're looking at this person who's like, Oh, I'd love to be them, but I'll never get there. You know, how many people do you know that are like, Oh, I want to be a famous YouTuber, but I only have 600 followers. I'll never get to a million. I'm like, I'll well, yeah, well, not with that idea. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not with that mindset. You know, I have a seven year old now and he, he talks about sometimes this whole idea of like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, you're never going to get there with that attitude. You got to believe that you can. not But again, it gets back to the point of how do you understand belief and where is real belief? I had done so much work. I had had so much adversity to get to those moments. Nothing was taking me away from them anymore. Nothing. And, and I would never let myself do that because I had built a mindset of standing to those adversities of standing up to the nose of being told in that doors over there, the doors over there, the doors over there, the doors over there, checking doors. I know what that's like each door. And so once you build that experience in and then you get to the right door and the lights there, you're like walking right in because I, I, this is, I deserve this. And this is something like to your point, why not? Why not me? All of these other players that have, you know, you know, not even had close to the amount of adversity that I had to get to in those environments. I used to almost take it personally. I'd be like, you think this is hard? This is easy. This is the easiest thing I've ever done. All I got to do out and be a, be a competitor, be a good teammate and use my skills to be exactly the player that I know I am. And again, I'm not there being super fancy and doing things out of my comfort zone and doing things for the, for the show or for the billion eyeballs to impress. That's also when you can get in trouble. And a lot of players do that. All of a sudden, they, the big lights are on and the big game's on and I'm doing something in my character that I normally wouldn't do. And that's when ego starts to get involved. That's when we start to succumb to the pressure of the eyeballs. But when we are both good coaching and just good mindset and awareness teaches you that like, I had a very simple mindset when I played. And that was my job was to, um, to hunt and kill. It's my job. I was a central defender. So I have the forwards. Those are the scores. I got to kill those guys. I got to kill the reputations because the reputation is way bigger than mine. Number one, always. The best players in the world, the Ronaldos, the Messis, the Drogbas, the Roonies. These are guys I had to mark every week. These guys are the best players in the world. These guys make 30 times my wage. And their reputation is a mountain compared to my little hill over here. And so instead of looking at my hill and being like, oh, it must be nice on that mountain. I'm like, I'm on the mountain today. Now I'm going to see if you can climb it. It's your mountain. But I'm going to test the crap out of you. And I'm going to make sure for 93 minutes, you're going to know my name. And that's all I can do because your reputation will always kill mine. Always. So all I can do on that 93 minutes is test it and test it and test it and be relentless in that approach. And that's all I could ever do. So my job was to be relentless, hunt, kill reputations, and win the ball and give it to somebody better than me. So how do you stay motivated? 
because a lot of it is just the hard work and that your TEDx is really good about that. You're like, well, my left foot sucks. So I go hit, um, I don't just go hit the ball against the wall. I go tape all these targets all over a wall and I systematically practice and practice and practice. And, and mm -hmm. I, I just do hard work. Like your, your theme through everything is, is hard work and, and get and, granular and, and believe. Yes. Yeah. And, and kind of be systematic, but what you got to enjoy, you must really enjoy an element of, of the process. And I, you know, I love the, the door analogy because like you can open, you can come up to 33 doors that are locked. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you just got to open the 34th one. And, and that's your, <laughs> that's your, yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's like the, the, the Celestine, Celestine, Celestine prophecies. Is that that book yeah. is? It's, I love that book. It's like, it's kind of like, it's your journey, right? Like mm -hmm. the, that closed door brought you to this one. And, and then that, you know, dead end brought you over this one. So you took a mm -hmm. turn over here, but it, I like, when, when I'm in my best flow and, and feeling good and, and doing, doing right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm like, I'm like living my story, like in, in the present moment. I'm like, mm -hmm. and then this happened and then that failure happened over there, but then I went over there, but this is how it's kind of supposed to be to get us to where we want to go. But the motivation and, and, and staying inspired through all that, you must like the work. Yeah. I love the work. And again, I always looked at it as such a privilege. You know, I always talk about, you know, especially the kids that we develop now. It's like, I always ask them if they think about them being in line to the pros, where would they be in that line? If you think about all the players in this world, and especially even in Vancouver, you know how many players in Vancouver want to be a white cap from 14 to 20? Thousands in a line. Do you know how long? And I make them visualize this. And I say, because that's what I was doing. I was visualizing this line all the time. When I landed in England, the line was a mile long. And I'm sitting there going, oh, shit, how am I going to do this? How do you hop people in line? How do you get better people? How do you start start making your way up front? And so I always looked at it as like this big, like, where am I in line? And how am I going to now get to the next piece? And again, that's back to that granular thinking, that design thinking of like, okay, cool. Now that I'm here, what do I, what do, I do to kind of navigate this or do whatever? But, you know, when you, when you understand where you are in line, you can understand how to navigate it. And that's where, again, being honest with your journey, to your point, everyone is singular. We can't compare ourselves to other people. You know, some kid that didn't make it as a 23-year-old, but he'd been playing in a system for eight years since he was 12, being in these bright lights and showing how good he was. So at 19, he didn't get picked. I would say, okay, that, that might be the right pick. I didn't even get picked until I was 23. And so now all of a sudden at 25, I shouldn't be super hard on myself. I'm only two years in. So let's be, let's be light on ourselves. Let's figure out what the good pieces are, keep them, shed the ones by, you know, building a, a, a humble approach to how you look at yourself and create more awareness around that. And then with that help of awareness, you start to refine. And then that starts to bring out this confidence that starts to like find these skills that you and only you have. And that's back to your journey. That's back to like, what do I bring to this team that no one else can bring? Cause that's why I got picked. And I used to always take confidence in that. That was always like, where do you find your confidence to walk into those? That was one of the things I used to do. I used to always think when I'm sitting in that tunnel and I'm the best players in the world, Ronaldo's, Rio Ferdinand's are there. And I'm going, somebody else picked me to be here. I didn't pick myself. You don't pick yourself in this game. Somebody picked you. And so take immediate confidence in that. Take immediate confidence. And I'm looking at it as out one of the chosen 11 to go out there and combat these guys. So take that as a privilege, take that as the pressure that you want in this life. And, and that's high performance. And I used to always think about that instead of saying, oh, well, am I good enough? Holy crap, that is Ronaldo. Like, how am I going to go play against that guy? And then I'd go back to myself and being like, you are in a situation where somebody picked you to go play against that guy. So go play against that guy. Go kick him. Go see what he's about. Go test his reputation because that's all you got and get back to your training. And that's Win the ball and give it to somebody else better than you. So cool. <laughs> I, uh, I, lo I, love, I love the line analogy um, that really helps with, like, there's a lot of other people kind of doing whatever we want to do. I've done, um, I've done a little bit of acting in some acting classes, so I've been looking for an agent over the mm -hmm. last year. Uh, applied to all of them, you know, and I know you've done some acting as well. It's kind of fun, eh? It's, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, emailed them all, and there was actually a, an open casting call, one of them downtown in the summer. So like they opened their doors for, for one day in July, I think it was, I can't remember the exact date. So I'm like, Oh yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll roll down there and I'll, uh, you know, I mean, my, my acting resume is, is like three lines, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, they just got to see me in person. Right. And, and I'll just, I'll just no biggie. I'll just win them over. I'll go down like late morning and just roll up there. I go down. It was on Homer street. 
the line. <laughs> What's yeah. two blocks long? I was going to say, it's probably not far from here. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, cool, whatever. No big, I'll come back at like close to three o'clock, right before they're, they close. And I'll go back. The line's even longer. Wow. So now I'm like, okay, that really helps uh, understand what, what we're up against yes. and, and, and who's there. But now I'm like, you know, I still kind of believe in that. I still think it's kind of fun. So maybe I'll take a different angle and, and, and put my own self on camera. And, and then we'll just see what if things kind of, you know, the dots get connected that way. But I think it's a, it's a great analogy to the line, the line of people trying to do what we're trying to do, but also be okay with starting at the back and, and kind of chipping your way up, mm-hmm. up to the front. Yeah. And I always say like, it's not, it's not where you are. It's just understanding where you are. Mm-hmm. You know, people define the position of the line as the thing. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not, it's where was your position last week? And if it's, <clears throat> if I'm 10 spots ahead now, keep doing what you're doing now it's just patience and time Mm -hmm. you know when you start thinking about the long game or or, you know where you're going again dream big think small dream big is i'm at the front of the line and i get that part i know i'm in a line of 400 people that have the same option to get that part too so i'll let them do their thing but i'll bring in my game because i've been preparing for this part and i know this and so when i get my shot i'm going to take the best swing at it because I've refined myself to step into that moment with the best opportunity for myself and so that's what i just kept putting myself into those environments in and then the idea is, and this is what the TED Talk was about too, is like, now what are you going to do? Because all of a sudden you're there and the lights are on. Now it's performance time. Did you do enough? Did you prepare properly? Is your mindset ready? Are you out to hunt and kill or are you just happy to be there? Mm-hmm. All very different mindsets, but all definitely something that you can work towards when you hit those pieces and you're the tip of the sword instead of just holding a sword. It's a very different thing. And so I've just concentrated on the tip. Follow, follow, follow. Refine, refine, refine. Be the tip. And then go out and do your job. That's so cool. Uh, let so let's talk a little bit of like what happened after the soccer because you've taken all of this mindset. It's not just mindset; it's a, it's a way of life. It's a belief. And mm-hmm. how so? How did you get into working with the youth and and the the foundation work and and these events you put on with the and rise and shine and all of that? How did that come to be? Out of like, how, how was that end of soccer? Was it right? Did you have a vision of of doing some work, or were you already doing it with with the youth? Uh, I mean, I mean, again, when you're chosen captain, as as both clubs that I played for were, I was chosen as as the leader of that of that crew, right? And so, I got experience. Seven of the ten years I played pro, I was chosen captain by my clubs, both in England and here in, at, at the Whitecaps. And leadership for me was always something that, based on my experience, I was able to kind of have a well rounded view at. You know, really, in my opinion, leadership is relatability. Because if I can't relate, you'll never listen. And if you don't listen, I can't leave. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You have to be able to open your ears to an, a piece of information or to a conversation. And so the good thing about my story, which I had no idea when I was in the trenches, was that I was creating a relatability all over the place. Mm-hmm. I was creating a relatability to the person that sits on the bench. I was creating a relatability to the person that got picked. And then once I made it pro, I'm, I'm, I can relate to, uh, to, to, the, to the captain uh, or the, the former captain that I was learning from. And so with that, it started to create relationships all around the game. And so with that, you know, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I grew up in a community sports town that loved their players. The players loved them. All of a sudden, I step into an environment. I feel like I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'm staying after and I'm riding the kids' bikes up to the stadium and I'm giving them autographs and taking pictures and, and being a community person because that's what a good leader does because there's a relatability there that says, I am no different than you. And that is something that I always had built into me because of my experience, because I had built from a, I was built from a blue collar environment that cared about their community. When I walked in as a professional and became the leader of those communities, I knew what that was like. And so that's how I acted. And so I think all those trainings within my life had had prepared me for those, those leadership roles. And so with that, you act and you go, okay, well, what, what do you guys need from me? Uh, I'm, uh, I can lead this community. I can lead these players. I, uh, I can do these types of things, but now it's now goes deeper. Now it's, you know, leadership is something that it can, especially in a soccer environment, it goes very deep. You know, this is a game that's led by its fans, not by its players. Players are secondary and then it's the club and then it's the players. And so, or sorry, tertiary, the, 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 the players, because we're nothing without the club. The club is our employer, but the club is nothing without its fans. Mm-hmm. And so with that, you have to be, as a captain, you have to be kind of the centrifuge of all those pieces. Right in the middle of that triangle, you're the centralized cog of like understanding what the players need, being with that to the front office, coaches, administrators, all that leadership group, 
administration. And then you have the fans, which again is the real driver of the ship. If you can't connect with that and they don't want to cheer for you, how are you gonna how are you gonna create a culture? Culture is we win, lose, or draw, and you're coming. Everywhere else in the world does that. This city's working on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no disrespect, Vancouver, but uh, it's working on it. And, and, and that's North American culture. We're 100 years behind in North mm-hmm. American soccer culture. So we have a lot of work to do as far as why we come. You know, it's to come, you go to England, it's because they've been coming for 100 years. Mm-hmm. It's because that's what it's they do culture. with their grandpa on yeah. Saturdays. It's yeah. because this pub is across the street from my house, and that's the leeway to my walk to the stadium. All of them are different. All of them are real. And then, then you have the players fit into that. And then from there, you go, okay, as a player, how'd, well, maybe I'll come to that bar after the game when we lose. And I'll come buy you guys pints because that's the way that you'll go, you know what? I'll come next week. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, again, like, those are the pieces from a leadership perspective where you can create like, relatability within the community and the culture of the club. And so I was able to do that in, in a lot of those places. But as you come out of the game, uh, again, a very long-winded way to answer your question was like, you have all this leadership. And then all of a sudden you have all these great experiences, both all the way to the bottom of the barrel to the top of the top, you know, standing on with your national anthem as one of 11. It's the only top top of the top. It's the way it's it's as high as it gets. But I also know what it's like to sit on the bench and and wait, get Mm -hmm. paid 20 bucks and get told I would never make it and get told like you better move. That's cool too, Mm -hmm. because now all of a sudden I have that relatability, you know, to the person that doesn't believe in themselves or has been told no a bunch of times. And so as I came out of the game, I, I started to think about, okay, well, how do you want to give back that experience? And some guys like to go into coaching. Some people want to, I didn't want to stay in the same schedule. When you're a pro, like you have a lot of time off, but the days are always there. You don't get chunks off. You never get days off. You had six, I, I had 13 days off a year hmm. Hmm. for many, many years, especially hmm. when you play internationally. So you play for your country too in these like break tournaments between your, your, your clubs. So I was getting two weeks off a year. Again, that's not a complaint. It was just the truth. And so when you come out, you're like, okay, how do you want to give that back? And so I, I just thought, you know, as someone who's a son of teachers, education's built into my, my world. I didn't want to get on the same schedule as professional coaches because then I'd be traveling around like I used to. And when you're done, you're just like, I want to, I want to go to my friend's weddings. You know, I want to, I want to go see my, my, my family for over a week at the lake. <laughs> you know, yeah. sounds quite normal, but you just don't get those opportunities a lot when you're, when, when you're playing at, at that level. And so, um, that was my number one thing was like go and enjoy life but also now um how do you give back and for me it was if all those pieces came back to like teenagers yeah because i i would do camps for little kids and they're fun but you start talking about a world cup and then like they just want to go pick the daisies yeah that's cool yeah go pick the daisies i'm not telling you you can't go pick daisies but you're not getting out of my you're not getting anything out of my world cup experience for me that's not enough for how you want to get back to the game. If you go and play in those environments, you want someone that would appreciate that on a deeper level. So that's when I'd start to talk to teenagers and I'd be like, oh yeah, when you play against Messi and their their mouths drop and their eyes bulge out and they're like, what? Because when you can start to explain those environments and you start playing against the best players because they now have a very small inkling in their 15 year old brains that maybe they could be a pro someday. Again, going back to leadership, now you're gonna, now they're gonna listen. Now they're gonna open their ears. Now they're going to retain that information and now they can start to practice. And they'll, therefore, I as a leader can start to ha- have an influence on their life as a mentor. And so that's kind of how it all started, it was, was, was building that. But then it's also like mentorship at its core. Then I'm like, I don't want to sit here with my Jade Merit camp doing the Jade Merit thing, being Jade Merit. Like, I don't care. It's not about that for me. It was about rise and shine. Rise and shine is a story. It's a mentality. And that's why when my, my life got turned into this movie in 2011, like on Kickstarter. People I didn't even know, almost 2,000 people I have never even met before in my life are donating their money on Kickstarter to turn my life into a documentary film called Rise and Shine. And so that's when Rise and Shine started. It was this whole idea of like having people tell me before I even knew how important the story is, the development of people, let alone like especially kids. We need to believe in that. And the filmmakers that brought this to my attention were like, it's not how you made it. It's how you, sorry, it's how you made it. It's not once you made it. There's a million players I can tell you what it's like to play in these top leagues. But very few played in a park and had a design degree and had to figure it out themselves in the biggest jungle in the world and then make it. That's the story. It's not the other piece. That's the end. But the story of why it matters is the beginning. 
and the fight and the resolve and the adversity and all the things that came along with what a rise and shine story is because 99 percent of us got to do it the hard way mm-hmm. we, we don't have the gifts of lebron james and lionel messi and tiger woods and yeah. in all of these you know incredible actors mm-hmm. they've been doing that since the moment they were two mm-hmm. and these are the people that we need to stop comparing ourselves to one but it's also this whole idea of like most of us have to do it the hard way most of us have to stand in front of adversity put yourself into a bunch of doors get a bunch of criticism learn a bunch of stuff and then you'll make it but it's the ability to stay there and to want it to be there and to want to stay there and get punched in the face on purpose and 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 that's it's really what i represent and and what rise and shine is and so what I do now with the holistic leadership of the program is that I don't do it myself. So every day I have a professional that's like me in their field, made it to the pros. It's a chef that works at the restaurant of the year in Vancouver. It's the, the captain of the Canucks. It's the uh, Olympic swimmer. It's the head of engineering for EA, for the video game of EAFC. So I know all these people because of my leadership role in these communities. Head of Children's Hospital, head of engineering for you know a tech company. What's a CEO like? What your CEO tells what it's like to sell their company for $100 million and the kids get the same drop of the mouth. Same thing that they did when I tell them about Messi. And so within that, I started to see the power in a story and, I'm start, and, that's, and that, that mixed mentorship of allowing kids to dream big in other directions. Because what happens now and my biggest thing, because I used to, you know, again, why you start this is, is kind of like, I saw problems in youth development. I saw a bunch of 15 year olds every year call me crying. I was the captain of the team and they wanted, they got released from the club and I, they wanted me to help. Them. I'm like, I, I mean, no other coaches, I, but that's about it. Can you get me a college scholarship in America? You're American. Do you know this artist? Because I know you do art stuff. I don't know. Do you like art? I don't know. You're 17. You don't know. So I started to really ask questions of the clubs. Well, guys, you're, the White Caps, or you're Watford, and you're going, you're calling yourselves a high performance environment. But at 18, 90% of those kids are going to go have to get a job in something else that has nothing to do with the sport. And you're going to call that high performance? You're creating mental health challenges for these kids by telling them that they have to be one thing their whole lives mm-hmm. and not surrounding them with professionals that are going to give them their real future. And so that was the real, that was the real foundation of why was that we need to give them a more well-rounded experience of high performance because they're going to have to go be high performance in something else. And if we're not planting those seeds at 14, 15, 16, 17, the fall in your face moment is coming at 19, 100%, because I see it all the time. And, and that's singular, but it's not singular to sport. It's, yeah, it's, music. Like, it's like this pent-up talent or desire for leadership or or whatever that, that has nowhere to go i've, I've been there and, and lived that you have so much you want to do and you feel so great and you want to do all this stuff but there's no way to 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 let it out yes and then shit happens yes well, exactly and adversity is guaranteed in this life and so you know we we can't sit here and think that our path is always going to be rosy but it's also like let's just say i'm 17 and all of a sudden through the programs i've met a ceo a head chef a fireman an engineer a talk show host and uh, and an actress. You think those little seed plants aren't going to be like, hey, seventeen year old, you just got released from said program. You're not going to be a musician anymore. What do you want to go do? And you're like, hmm. Well, those engineer lessons I had with that cool person that I connected with and related to a little bit seemed pretty cool. Maybe I'll go into engineering school again. There's still confusion. There's still a little bit of loss on your path, but you're not falling flat on your face and trying to commit suicide yeah. because this is what's going on. We're, we're not talking about light problems here. We're talking about suicide. We're talking about mental health challenges that have never, ever been like this on the history of the planet is where we're at with teenage and teenage people that are suffering and wondering and living in stress and anxiety because that's what they do. I start every one of my camps every year and I only do 20 kid camps because if I don't know your name, you're never going to get to know me anyway. Yeah. And I, I want you to know me and I want to know you. Because that's the only way this works. Mentorship is a two-way street. It's not me telling you to be like me. That's not good mentorship. That's that's me and my ego. Mm-hmm. And 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 so with that, now how do you actually change a curriculum that allows you to create environments like that? First, it's not me standing and talking to them all the time. The chef comes in at lunch and goes, "Here, let's cook Caesar salad and uh, and and spaghetti bolognese for lunch because you're 17 and you should know how to cook this meal. <laughs> it's cheap, it's easy, and it's nutritious. Great, let's do that today." Because I'm going to teach you, and with the help of the pro, not me, I'm not a professional chef. 
I like food. I understand nutrition. I know those things really help me in my life. And I want to help your life because that's my job as a mentor. And so with that, you create a well-rounded curriculum and you get these kids to start practicing. And then it finds them. We're saying, I'm not finding you. You're finding you, yourself. And, and so with that, I got to create practices. And so that's what we do through our curriculums. Uh, again, I love hanging out just like you. I love hanging out with people that go out and do stuff and, 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 and good, bad, ugly. They got stories to tell. And that's the learning experiences that we have to give in mentorship and storytelling and doing things just like this. It's, it's, it's about knowledge and education and information and all these, and all these things. And, and, and so with that, if you can, and me and the other people I bring in through the programs, if we can help pave the way so you don't got to learn the hard way, it's way better for all of us. <laughs> so how, how, how do people get their kids in these programs? How, how does, does someone apply to these programs and how many, how many camps are there and how many kids, what are the, what are the logistics? Where can people find out more? Yeah, well, they're incredible. Well, and this is kind of, we're a small unit. Um, I, it's a summer program just because I do, I do other things. Um, and ultimately what I've been doing after about three or, three or four years, we're almost eight years into the program now, is that about four or five years into it, I was like, I'm running around the, the, the planet. And I've done them in England here, um, in Wisconsin, New Jersey, New Mexico. So I was doing them in lots of different places. But again, they're niche. And I don't want to be a camp counselor my whole life. I no disrespect to camp counselors. You guys are, I, I applaud you. <laughs> camp counselors, people that do this every day, it's really, really hard. Um, but it's valuable. It's really valuable work. And, and, and so I started to think about scalable ideas. And so I started to think about, okay, well, imagine if I could take my three day camp and bottle up all the people, tell the stories, but turn them digital. But instead of having a kid just sit here and watching episodes of one person, what if they could choose all of these people from actors to chefs to kind of like what masterclass does. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm talking to Gen Z. And so they're not going to watch a 14 minute video about some old dude that cooks. Mm -hmm. They want to watch some chef that they follow from some restaurant that they live by and they want it gamified. They want it fun. They want short form content. They want to take games. They want to, they want to take quizzes. They want to, they want to, with TikTok coming through, it was like, they want to challenge. They want to do, I want to set up my phone and show you that I can chop an onion in less than a minute. I want to watch a fitness coach from the Canucks tell me about like how the Canucks warm up and I, and, and I want to that do that cool. with them. And then I want to, but you, how many of us know who the fitness coach at the Canucks even is? I don't. Exactly. No, I don't either. But the idea is we should, mm -hmm. if we're going to care about the culture of that club, just like in any other sport or any other restaurant or any other tech company, it's the same. Why aren't we hearing the stories that are deeper? Why aren't we practicing what those people are mm -hmm. doing? So then as I develop as a young person, I will now be able to refine and refine and refine. So by the time I'm 19, I'll be like, I've done the acting lessons. That was super fun. That lifted me up. I hated the chef lessons. I didn't like that. So I'm just, I'm not going to be a chef, but I should still learn how to cook because I want to, I want to earn this, this like gift card at this restaurant I like. Yeah. And so that's the end of the gamification. It's mm -hmm. like you get things for your effort. You don't just nice. like, Hey, it doesn't go to the air or to the cloud or some points that don't exist to give me anything of value. Imagine if those points now got a zoom call with the host of the show or a day at training at the Canucks or a, a pair of Nike shoes from the fitness coach all very valuable, all very sing singular to the user. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, because I'm using, because I'm scoring points in all these directions and doing the challenges and answering the quizzes and watching the videos of all these rad people, imagine now of the skill sets that I'm planting with him. Imagine the practices I'm getting that are refining my knowledge about myself because we don't just know it, we feel it. And when we feel it, that's when we know it. And so it's the opposite. And so if I, if I chop an onion less than a minute and that lifts me up, I'm like, okay, I like that. That's a seed plant I want to keep. And so with that, we create that and we can create it digitally and we can create it through an app. So any kid anywhere for free can learn. And now you create opportunity of education. And so that's really where we go. We, we're creating education opportunities for people, A, that don't have them, B, that don't have good mentorship, or C, that can't afford it. Because all three of those are the biggest staples and, 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 and hurdles within all these young people's lives. And so, you know, that's really the goal. And, and, and we signed our, our first partnership with EA, the big video game company here in Vancouver. Um, and so they're helping us build it. We'll hope to launch in 2024. Nice. And uh, we filmed 80 episodes so far. We got skiers, actors, actresses, chefs, meditation experts, 
everybody that you can think of. It's what I, the bankruptcy. The most important thing about this is that it's all built around the mind. And so the profiles for every user is not your face. It's your brain. Oh, wow. And it's split into the nine forms of intelligence built up by a multiple intelligences theories by a, a guy named Howard Gardner. And it was like, he was, he was a psychologist that talked about when you develop people, you should develop through nine forms of intelligence. Cause you've never, you never know you're a good chef unless you've picked up a knife. You never know you're a good athlete until you've ran a mile. And so these are ways we can practice to understand the intelligence that live within all of us. But we actually have now mental health monitoring and, and what we like to call in, in our tech program, the flip of the mirror, because right now, everything that we do social media based is external. Mm -hmm. Everything I do, I put a photo of me, that's internal, but then what I receive is external. Mm -hmm. I'm not recreating anything outside of what other people tell me about myself. But now imagine if the mirror is flipped and every time I do an actor lesson, I get points in my brain and the acting section grows. Mm -hmm. And then I do a chef lesson and in the nutrition side and I start to learn more about like creative intelligence because I'm making meals. And so I'm you're like you're gamifying education. Which yeah. I think you've just specifically said, but you're, it's like a game to, to put your time towards growing your mind and your health and, and there's numbers and points on it. Yeah. And that's mental health 101. Is, yeah. is, is if, if we're looking at ourselves and are watching our knowledge and our intelligence and what we like and our skills and our, the, the, the seeds we're trying to plant, watch them all grow because we can do that. It's just we need to focus inward, not outward. And so the whole concept is based on that. It's mental health. Mental health is inward. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's fully inward. And, but we're not, and this is why we look at the epidemic we're in right now in, in, in mental health crisis. It's that because every validation we're looking mm -hmm. for in this life is external. It's outward. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is fundamental and this is, this is a fundamental issue. And so this is what we're trying to change. It's what we're trying to, and it's not just like talking about it. It's giving people tools. And that's what our camps and our programs and, and, and my whole concept is all about. It's like, we're not just talking about it. You got to do it. I'm not just bringing up a chef. We're cooking. You, you, you know what I mean? I'm not just bringing up an engineer. We're doing pulleys and we're doing a ropes concert. Doing, doing it. To that's see how if you can learn climb the too. tree. You see it and you be it. Exactly. And that's how I learned. And so I know it worked for me, but I also know that if we can create systems that allow people to practice as well as create good mentorship, now we got a good formula to give people a good chance of understanding. But if I'm getting a point for reading a book and watching an educational YouTube and, and writing a paper and doing a podcast, like, I do all those things anyways, but if I'm getting points and scores, like I'm doing them more. Yeah. Right? Well, and it's not just the points. It's what you get for those points. That's the real carrots because you're getting cool stuff. You're getting interviews from the person you're watching. You're getting a That's Zoom cool. call with 50 kids that specialize in hockey that get the, get the Zoom call with TJ Miller. You get, you know, the, the people in Chicago because with technology, we have so many capabilities we're not unlocking. Yeah. We can have kids in Vancouver only winning the Vancouver stuff. We can have kids in Chicago that are own, that in an in a underprivileged environment that are earning the new, we were talking to the Milwaukee Bucks last year about this intern competition because they're like the Milwaukee Bucks, big NBA team. And they were talking about how generally the person they give the internships is like administrators, kids, some donor, something. And so they're like, we want to change the code to get a new interns in here from, uh, you know, underprivileged backgrounds, people from that inner city Milwaukee that, that want the chance to be, you know, a, a, a hospitality director. Yeah. And so you go, okay, cool. Well, let's watch four episodes about what the hospitality director does. How do you throw a party for 20,000 people three nights a week during your season? Watch those episodes, understand if you like it. And if you are in this 50 mile radius within this underprivileged area, we are only going to choose the kids that come from here. And so you can geotag things, you can geotag locations, you can find and really create anything with tech now. It's not hard. These are things that are existing five years ago, not right now. So we're not inventing tech. We're just inventing a new way to use it and a new behavior that comes with it. It's so sweet. It's uh. Uh, it's inspiring, but it's great to hear the background and the why of, 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 of why you do it and, and what, what drives you. Um, I got two more questions. So where, number one, like where can people keep track of this and where, how can we know when this app is coming out and, and what's the best, is the best way to follow you or best way? Yeah. To any of the social medias are good. Um, I'm D6 Merit on any of my socials. Uh, Rise and Shine is the program. RXS Mentorship is our online programs. Um, I work with a really cool DJ. She has her master's in psychology. 
Um, we work together with online mentorship. So we do, we have clients from all over. We work with professional poker players. We work with adults as well as kids through our mentorship programs. Uh, people think that mentorship has to be kids. It's not, it's, 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 it's a, like I was saying, it's just a conversation. It's a, it's, it's a two way street of, of information and, and, and development. And, um, and so we work with a lot of different people on, on our mentorship sites, but, um, that's kind of how we participate online in person. I, it's a summer program. So generally I have kids from around this area. Um, but then we create a, a more of a social environment. So our, our fundraisers, um, we raise money to send underserved kids to camp for free. And so we have first nation kids from all over the province that come. I work with the downtown East side programs. And so I work with the programs to find the kids that deserve their chances because they work hard for their clubs. They're good kids that have just had a hard road for a bit. Um, they're good kids that uh, are really showing great leadership and their coach wants to give them another opportunity to expand and they want to gift them to that because they know they're, they can't afford it or whatever. And so they all come for different reasons, but with that, they come, f they actually get a couple different things. One is that they get put in a high performance environment, but then they actually, they actually get to be in a social environment with kids that aren't like them. Yeah. And that's one thing that we're lacking in our programs now. If you look at every kid that plays for Coquitlam FC or Vancouver FC or North Van FC, they're all pretty much the same kid. Yeah. And so you're missing the social environment because public school, when I went to high school, I had kids of all ages, colors, everything. But we don't create those environments in academy programs. We don't. It's very different now. And so that's another way we can start to recreate that environment of like having kids from all walks of life being in a room. Imagine that. And I, I have so many stories over the years of like, you know, I remember always that, that one of the kids from from uh, Mount Curry. We had I used to run my program up in Pemberton, and this was a, a kid from the uh, from Mount Curry, and he had he had come in and he had never had an opportunity to be at a camp before. First Nations kid, and we start talking about what we do in our spare time, and we're at bonfires, like where we go around the whole bonfire, we just talk about where we're from, what we're doing, just to get the kids talking, because yeah. if they don't know, and they're not going to ask, because they're too young, they don't really get it. So that's my job to kind of create the environments. And this kid starts talking about how he bull rides on the weekends. Uh -huh. And he starts talking about this belt buckle that he's wearing and his jeans. And this kid who, again, never even thought he deserved to be there, is now lifting himself up and he's lifting up the whole bonfire. And these sure. kids are just like after it. I watch these kids go up and talk to this kid because of that. Because he was doing things that all these kids thought was crazy and cool. That's right. And he walked into that environment and he walked out of that environment with way more confidence, with way more self-belief, and with way more of an understanding that he's just like them. And that's, you know, that's the social side of what we can create in our programs. It's not just the skills, it's the social, it's the conversations, it's this acceptance that allows development. And that's, we're a development program. You know, this isn't, this isn't something that is, is, is trying to be beyond that. And, and development is, is it's, it's not singular, it's, it's everything. And I'm continuing to develop every day. New, new, new practices, new concepts, you know, continue to take on adversities in my life. You know, it's taken me three and a half years now to get this thing up, running, COVID, trying to film in, in when no one can even be in the same room, losing money. We were a team of nine. Now we're back down to two. We're just friends and we're about to walk into Apple in the next couple of weeks. And, and that's just taken standing in the fire, waiting for this opportunity. Finally, a couple pieces have fit over the last couple months. Those pieces now know and have a relationship with Apple and now going, this isn't a big deal. I talk to them all the time. I'm doing stuff with them. Okay, it totally took me two years to get to that opportunity yeah. but because I stood in that fire and because we're, you know, we're still working to that goal. Now, all of a sudden, that goal hits two years on. You're like, oh, Jesus, this is what I'm waiting for. But geez, just like sitting on the bench for a year and a half going, oh, I know I'm, I think I'm good enough, but I need the opportunity. I need to show not only to myself, but to others. And so they, these, these things never change. This was 17 years ago. Now, 23 years ago, when I actually was sitting on that bench, and I'm sitting on the bench right now. So when you, which brings me to my last question, full circle, thank you very much. But when, when, you, were, when you were sitting on the bench back there, you had the vision of where you wanted to be in the, the Premier League, and that was what you, was driving you forward towards that. What, with all you're going through now, and, and uh, appreciate your time, and appreciate your stories, and, and looking forward to, mm -hmm. to more, but generally appreciate your, the work that you do in, in the world. So, mm -hmm. um, awesome. Thank you. What's, what's the vision though? What, what's, what's, what's the premier league right now? What's, what's, what's driving you forward? What's, what's kind of your next, your next, uh, your next big dream that you're taking the small steps towards. 
I mean, the vision is that we become the first real positive social media on the planet that is creating a betterment of a, of a community and of self all while making it fun and have everybody win because that doesn't exist. It just doesn't. And so our saying on the wall is that everybody wins and we believe that we can create a social media where everybody does. And that will be a groundbreaking thing. And, and the fact that EA and hopefully Apple over the next couple of weeks will have recognized that again, tells me that just keep doing what you're doing. It's the same way a scout tells you to keep doing what you're doing. Those validations to me is all I need. It's not spending all your money, investing in your dreams, standing in fires and being told no hundreds of times now for fundraising, for people that think that it's too big, people that think that we're too small, people that think that we can't pull it off. I know what that feels like, but I know that what it's like to actually see the visions, see them come true, but also taking a chance on them. You know what I mean? And that's that's the goal is to really change the big problem. And that is social media is killing us, not helping us. Powerful. I got goosebumps. So that, <laughs> that means that means things are gonna get lit up. So no, appreciate you. That mm -hmm. is not a small problem to take on, but no better dude for the job. <laughs> well, you know, here we go. Lace them up and let's get out there. <laughs> I'll help. Uh, we'll all help. Everyone listening will help how, however ever we can. But no, appreciate you. Thank you, Thank you so Mark. much to be to be continued. Yes. Cool. See you soon. We'll come back. Yes. We'll yes. Back. When we've got the first <laughs> ever positive social media just humming around and the, and the whole world has changed. That's right. Shit. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it.